Welcome to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast, where we inspire women by teaching applicable skills and tools and assisting them with connecting with one another, healing, and aspiring to their highest selves so they can reach their full potential. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have Tarika Bishop with us. And she has such a beautiful story, and I'm so excited for her to share that with you today. Uh, So our topic today is the art of healing from a faith transition. And um, her story is so beautiful. And so I want to introduce her. Terika loves people and can geek out over all things human behavior. (laughs) She graduated with a bachelor's degree in child and family studies and always intended on becoming a marriage and family therapist but an unexpected little one shifted those plans. So she and her husband, Scott, started their family, and several years later, she completed her coaching program and an advanced relationship certification, which is almost done. After 20-plus years of marriage, they have four kids, 19 years old to 7 years old. She has a tender spot for those whose spouses have left their faith and for the spouse in transition. Having experienced this with her own spouse, it's a pleasure to help couples hold on to their marriage and their families during this time. And she believes love is an endless resource of which we can never have enough of. I love that part about how love is this endless resource. It's so amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to do this. I think this is going to be really fun. It is. I love this. So um, just tell us a little bit about your story and what's brought you to where you're at today. Mm, Gosh, so many things. So I'm going to start back with, I'm going to start in the beginning, I guess, 20 plus years ago, almost 21 years ago, actually, when my husband and I got married. And I think sometimes in, I don't know what faith all of your listeners belong to. There's probably a diverse background, but in the... um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, if you, you get married in the temple and there's some expectations that go along with that. And so I think sometimes in our faith, we think that if we get married in the temple, then everything's just going to work out. Like we just took that step and now it's happily ever after. And I just think what we don't realize sometimes is that it's after that happily ever after that your true love begins because that's when the growth starts to take place and all the things and you add kids to the mix and all the things. And so um, then you fast forward to 2017. So back in 2017, my husband came to me and he just said, I can't do this anymore. And I was kind of like, I can't do what you can't do what. And before I go any further, I just want to say that anything that I share on here, as far as our story goes, I have full permission from him to, to share. So I'm not airing anybody's dirty laundry or this is all with permission to share. So he came to me and I I said, permission to do what? And he said, I just can't, I can't live a lie anymore. I can't live this life anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? And he just said, I can't, I can't be a member of this church anymore. I just, I just can't do it. And of course I was crushed. And so there were tears shed and a lot of sorrow and feelings of betrayal and all of that. And, um, then it was like within just a few weeks that he ended up taking off his, his garments. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, that's just a, a sacred article of clothing that we wear that it symbolizes the temple and the covenants that we made there. So, um, that is a big deal, you know, as a member of our faith. And so we went from that and I went to my Bishop and, you know, had some conversations there, um, just a really hard time. And a lot of uncertainties, like, well, what does my family look like now? And, and what about, what about our salvation as a family? Isn't that a family matter, you know? (laughs) And so, Through all of that, the twists and turns, he he had said to me, he was like, you know, I don't have a desire to go live another lifestyle. I still want to be the same person that I have always been, 
but I just can't do this anymore. So I will support you and the kids if that's what you want to do. But you know, this is just where I'm at. And so for a while he would go to church with us and, you know, he might hang out in the hallways and chit chat and whatever. And sometimes he would leave and go get coffee and then come back and, you know, be there to pick us up or whatever. Um, and then it turned into, there was a year in there in 2019, I believe. So just a few years later, that all kind of shifted where he was like, he had taken up drinking with friends and, um, just some things like that. And I didn't actually know about that that whole year. So then there became the deceit, you know, and the shame around that and hiding it from me and not knowing how I would respond and, and all of that. And so when that all finally came out, it was like, okay, so I thought you said you didn't want to be somebody else. I thought you said you didn't want to change your lifestyle. And that just kind of changes the farther away you get from your, the values that you grew up with, the religion you grew up in, you know, and you kind of take on some other things. And so if I could just like pause for just a minute, because I think one of the things that's really helpful for anybody who's going through this situation and is to differentiate religion and values. Because sometimes for the person who leaves, I, sometimes the reason that they do the things they do and they kind of go in that different lifestyle is because oftentimes the religion that you grew up in, the faith that you grew up in, it teaches all of these values, right? So when you separate yourself from that, it's like a whole other identity has to be formed. And sometimes they don't know how to um, separate what are my values and who am I now? And do I still hold on to those values? Because sometimes those values bring feelings of bitterness or anger or betrayal. And so they just want nothing to do with any of that. And so I think if you're a married couple going through this, I think one of the first things that you can do that is really important is go, Hey, and this is something I do with my clients is say, Hey, what are your values? And each of you write down your values. What do you value? Like honesty, respect, hard work. You know, those are a few things you might consider and then compare notes. And what is the same? And then come up with your couple or family mission statement around those values. And you can take from each other, right? But that just gives you a common ground to start from where we're not intertwining religion and values, but we can still have a valued based family in our new way of thinking and doing things together. So I just want to throw that out there because I think that's in all of them that I see my, and myself included with my husband, that's what happened is that loss of identity. And I have to, now I got to find myself again. Yeah. And I love that you shared that. That is, I really think a key concept to really understand, because I think oftentimes in relationships, when, especially when we're in a um, part of a connected whether it's spiritual belief or whether it's a religion, whether it's another faith system, that when someone leaves or separates from that and you've bonded in your relationship over this connection, it can be very challenging to navigate that. And so I love one of the things that you talked about in your bio that like everything comes back to love. But one of the questions I have is, you know, this piece of navigating when someone feels or believes differently than I do, you know, does that mean that I can no longer have a relationship with that person? Or does that mean that we can't get along? Or does that mean that, you know, that um, the relationship has to end? And I think this is a big question that a lot of people ask mm -hmm. because so much sometimes of our culture is based off of we have to think alike in order to have bonded relationships. Yet there's so much value to understanding each other's faith, belief, and faith can be how some, for some people, how they define it, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's not always connected to religion for some people. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I wondered if you could speak to that. 
So first of all, I'm going to say, I think our faith is always in transition as it should be, right? Because that's how we grow. It's how we learn. And if you think of, like, I don't know how familiar you are with um, Fowler's stages of faith, but I love, I love all of that because it takes human development and how we develop as children to, from children to adults, it takes Erickson's theories. And then it, it, it kind of combines that connects that with faith and the transitions that we go through. Mm. And so we grow in our faith and our faith is always in transition and it's necessary. So when you're in, when you're in like a stage three faith, you're checking the boxes. It's when you think that your rituals are magical. So like I said earlier, if I get married in the temple, then we're just going to all live happily ever after. Right. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Right. right. <laughs> it's yep. like, no, that's, that's not true. That's not true. We're still going to have our differences and we're still going to have, you know, the things that we're going to have to come together on and figure out together. And so our faith is always in transition. And I think that as you're navigating this, if you're a person out there who is navigating this with a spouse or you're the spouse that has, is going through this, first of all, I just want to offer like my heart felt compassion because Mm -hmm. I realize how tough this is and you're both in a tough situation and you're both trying to figure it out. But if you will allow this to be an opportunity to be curious about your own faith, to be curious with your spouse and what they're going through, because this is hard for them too. Um, and not take on that victim mentality, but instead show up with love for yourself and love for this person that you have shared all of this life with so far, right? And love for God. I just think that really is the basis of anything and everything you do to get through this transition. So I love that. I love that. So Can you share a little bit about just really shortly um, what you learned about those stages of faith um, for our listeners that haven't read that book yet? Yeah. So I started with the stage three because that's, I think, where most of us are. And actually Fowler in his book talks about how um, I want to say, you guys, please look this up and don't quote me on it because I have not memorized the book. Um, But I I believe that most people, in fact, I think it's like 70% of us stay in stage three for our entire lives. And Mm. he's very clear in in his book that um, none of these stages of faith are bad. They're all good. They're just stages of faith. And, And the truth is like, I, my faith has shifted and grown so much through this transition with my spouse, because he asks a lot of questions. And sometimes they're, they're oftentimes, most of the time, there are questions that I've never even thought about asking before, you know, that, and some of them are questions that don't matter to me, but they matter to him. And so just another little tip, if you can be in curiosity with your loved one, that's going through a transition, it will keep you out of judgment. And any time you can stay out of judgment and be curious You're going to get so much farther in your relationship and you're going to learn and grow too. Cause I have, my faith has deepened my relationship with my father in heaven and his son, Jesus Christ have become so solid. I mean, I thought they were really solid before, but they've just become like so solid and so tender and so deeply personal to me. And it's allowed me to let some of these other places we get caught in the weeds sometimes just let them be the puzzle pieces on the ground. I don't have to pick them all up right now. I can just let them be there and I can stand really solid in the things that I do believe in and that I know for myself and that really serve me. And that right there is the thing that helps me show up in love for myself and for my husband and makes all the difference. So I love that. I want you to continue with your story, but I'm just so excited about this conversation. I just have one more question to ask. So when you're talking about making that 
shift and change. And I know you're probably going to share a little bit more about the stages of faith, but maybe this will connect with it. Um, So moving through that transition, I can only imagine like that was a very stretching experience for you. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I think can really benefit our listeners is understanding what are some of the things you use to really get through that time as you were transitioning. um, And like you talked about, coming back to the sense of love and compassion and understanding and joy, all of these things that you were able to move through. I'm wondering, because there's a grief cycle that's connected to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So keep me on track here because that was a big question. And so I want to make sure I answer it. Yeah, Um, of course. But okay. So I would say one of the blessings for me was that I had been contemplating going back to be a marriage and family therapist, or if I was going to get my coaching certification and I was looking at a year of coaching cert versus a couple of years for MFT. And I just remember the day I was standing in my driveway. And so if we fast forward a little bit in my story, this will connect a little bit. My husband went through a time where then he was like, I don't know if I even believe in God. I don't want anything to do with this at all. Like it went from being supportive of what we were doing in our home to like, I don't want anything to do with it. And I don't even want this taught in our home. Well, that brought a new, (laughs) a new element to this whole navigation. Right. And so, um, it just so happened that during that summer, when that was all happening in our marriage and and, and also, uh, and it, this is not uncommon. So I just want to make sure that I, I say this with the utmost respect and understanding for my husband and where he was too, is oftentimes they, the person going the transition, and I think it can happen both ways, but the person going through the transition might latch onto someone else who really understands them, right? Who may have, and I say that with air quotes, <laughs> who has been through this themselves, who, who maybe has already been through that transition is no longer affiliated. And that's what happened. There were friends, some of the same sex, some of the opposite sex that he had latched onto in a big way where it was almost disconnecting and separating us because he wasn't turning towards me. He was turning away from me and towards them. And we all do that in our relationships. We either turn towards each other turn against each other or turn away from each other. And as often as we can, we want to turn towards each other. So as his wife, as I was like begging for that, he didn't think he could trust that I would respond in a way that would be loving, (laughs) you know, maybe more judgmental. And he also, he was scared. He was like, I don't even know how to approach this because this is a big deal, you know? So that those are all the things that were going on at the time. And in the same moment of being, whether I was going to do coaching or marriage and family therapy, it was like, I had this just really strong impression. It was like, jump into coaching and do it now. And so I just followed that. And as I did, and I didn't have the money for it. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but somehow I'm going to figure it out. Swipe the credit card and away we went, you know? So I jumped into that and in in doing that, I learned so many tools that helped me navigate the process, which is exactly what I teach my clients now. So the first thing is always being connected to yourself, right? And that's like, what do I believe? What do I want from this? What is my part in this? What belongs to me here and what doesn't? Now, what am I willing to let go? What am I willing to change my thoughts about? And what is worth standing up for? And so that right there, those are some of the questions and, and then using the tools of coaching that helped me get through that and really be solid in myself, hold that space for me, for him and for our relationship. So now I'm certain that I probably haven't answered your question in fully. And I've, (laughs) so do you have any questions that are coming up for you around what I just said? No, um, I feel like you really answered that question. And I think that's really, really helpful to understand. Thank you so much. Um, I do have some more questions, but I want you to finish what you want to with your story. And then I'll, then I'll ask you. Okay. 
So in the, just to kind of connecting where I was in that, that summer where he was at, and then I was in my coaching program at the time and I really worked hard on myself and what are my judgments for him? Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of self-confrontation and in all of your relationships, that's where we begin. You always begin with yourself, right? And so I was able to untangle some of those things for me and who I am and really feel empowered in what I was, what I believed and who I am and what I was doing. Um, and there came a moment in, and I, I really want to highlight this because I think this is true for a lot of people in this situation, but there came a moment where there, we, there was somebody that we were seeing to help us work through some of these things as well. And it, that didn't last very long, but, um, there was a moment where we had walked in to our session together and things like we were holding hands and all that. And, and I can't even tell you what happened in the session because it was like, whatever happened, but he got up and he left. And I was like, what in the world just happened? Like, did I say something that was hurtful? Did I, and I started thinking along what had just been talked about. And so, um, I just kind of excused us from the session and I went out and the parking lot and he was just beside himself and he was like, Oh, I'm just so, I'm just so, and he couldn't like quite find the words. And as I listened to him, just kind of throwing things out and I just, and I, I don't think this was me that connected this. I think it was my heavenly father that connected this for me, but see, I had been talking about the feelings of betrayal and these other people. And there was a specific someone of the opposite sex that he was communicating with and whatever. And I was really betrayed by that. I felt so, so sad and disconnected and really betrayed. And so I, we had been talking about that a little bit in the session. And when I, we were out in the parking lot, when I finally, it's kind of, he's kind of ranting. I said to him, I was like, okay, wait, I'm like, why are you so upset? And he was just like, I don't know. I'm just so, I just feel so, and he couldn't finish his sentence. And I just looked at him and he says, Oh, I said, I'm sitting here talking about feelings of betrayal and you feel betrayed too. And he just like looked at me and he was like, yes. And it was like, you feel betrayed by your family that they, they taught you a bunch of bull crap. That's how you think about it. And the, the church that you grew up in your ward, your community, like everybody just fed you a line of bull. And you felt betrayed. And he was just like, yes. And I just remember, I just was able to hug him and love him and just be like, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that you're feeling this way. Because while I didn't agree with or understand all the things he was going through, I absolutely could understand feeling betrayed and lied to. And that doesn't feel good to any of us. So I think. Again, if it's being connected to yourself allows you to then connect with your loved ones even more fully and more completely and show up in, with empathy and compassion. And I'm going to say it again, rather than judgment, because that is so destructive. So anyway, do you have any yeah. questions before I just keep going? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do have a question. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's beautiful that you were able to see things from his perspective and have have empathy for his perspective and his experience, true empathy and compassion and love in a situation where you were also feeling, going through a grief cycle, feeling betrayal as well. And so that's really impressive to me that you're able to connect with him in such a beautiful way. Um, But my other question I think is, and maybe you're going to answer this is how you were able to continue with this place of compassion and stay connected to yourself and to your own values during a time where your partner was transitioning to something other than um, maybe how, what you imagined or what you thought and how you were able to navigate that situation and stay connected to yourself and allow him the space to do the work that he needed to do. I think that that is the way is being deeply connected to yourself and understanding you. And again, coming back to that choice or to that question, wait, what belongs to me here? Mm -hmm. And what am I willing to let go? Because I think 
when you are connected with yourself. And can we talk about what that means a little bit? Because there's probably somebody out there going, what the heck does it mean to be connected to yourself? Yeah, right? Right. And so, so <laughs> maybe yes, backing up just a little bit. And that is just simply, you know, being aware of things like, like we talked earlier, what are my values? What do I value? What do I want? Because sometimes we're so um, tied up in all of our own emotions that we don't tap into that. We don't tap into what do we really want? What is this really about for me? And not in a selfish way. This isn't a very loving, selfless way of taking care of yourself. What are the thoughts and my beliefs that are creating all of these emotions for me? And what are these emotions? Like being able to name your emotions and know what those are. That's because all the things that we think create the things that we feel. And then everything we feel drives everything we do and everything we don't do. All of our behaviors, all of our reactions, all of the things we don't do. It's coming from an emotion. And if we're not tapped into that, it's really, we can get stuck in what Brene call, Brown calls um, the Willy Wonka crap tunnel <laughs> yes. know, of emotion yeah. and, and not be able to sort through them. You know, and so I think that is being deeply connected to yourself, being self aware instead of what we want to do, all of us in our humanness is blame somebody else or an institution, an organization for the way that we feel. And that's not where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that because we're each individually in our own faith journey always, always as well as our own um critical self-development um in terms of critical thinking but also a deeper connection to ourselves if we allow that process to happen because a lot of times we're asked to shift mm -hmm. and um, we're all in our own process so when we stay out of judgment it just offers this opportunity to see another perspective without getting stuck in maybe what that means about us mm -hmm. or, um, you know, what we can get stuck in, um, what we wish was different instead of accepting the reality that we're facing now. And that art of surrender, I think is one of the most beautiful places to be. And it's also a very, it's a rich place and it's also very challenging. Yeah. I love that you say the art of surrender because that, that's such a, like my whole insides just feel so like, <laughs> truth. Like that's just, yeah. it yeah. makes me just feel so calm and peaceful, like the art of surrender. And, you know, I think we often don't realize we want to fight our way to our next destination. And we, what we don't realize is you have to know where you are before you can map out where you're going. Like Siri can't get you anywhere unless she knows what your location is. And we can't get to our next step either unless we surrender, like you said, mm -hmm. or we know what our location is. We accept it. We're just, I am in my home. This is where I am. This is where I'm going. You know, mm -hmm. being able, you can't map out your destination until you know your location. And so I really, man, that art of surrender, like no accepting what is like my husband is no law, does no longer affiliate with the church of Jesus Christ. Like just being able to say that and go like, oh, oh yeah. Like this is actually true. I have a daughter in the same boat right now. My daughter no longer affiliates with the church of Jesus Christ, you know, um, and whatever her faith journey is at this point, I'm not sure, but, but, you know, and I just want to say too, if you're in the boat where a spouse is left the church and then you end up with a child in the same boat, it can be really easy for your brain to want to start blaming your spouse, mm -hmm. right? But just recognizing that we're all on our own journey and our own path and we all have to find our own way and figure this out. And it doesn't mean you did anything wrong as a spouse or as a parent. It means like, yes, self-reflect and let's like, look at where we're at and what we can 
do ourselves to improve ourselves for ourselves, right? But making sure you don't go to just watching yourself, being aware, being a compassionate observer of yourself. Where am I at? Am I going to blame? Because that would feel better than me taking responsibility for what is mine, right? And also not beating ourselves up for it. So I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, we have a few minutes left. And um, first of all, I want to ask, did you finish your story? Was there more that you wanted to share? Um, there was a space after that summer and into the fall. Where things, you know, we had talked about the whole betrayal thing, right? And there still wasn't honesty. And uh, it got to, a, and I value honesty. Like it's like my number one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so like, I can deal with whatever is happening. Like I can deal with whatever's happening, but you got to be honest with me. If we can't be honest with each other, it's really hard for me to trust, you know, Yeah. which of course, like it makes sense. Right. Um, so there just came a point where I was like, I am no longer willing to continue this relationship. I, and, and you know, what I love the most is using all of the coaching tools that I teach my clients is by having those in my pocket and in my soul, um, I was able to make a decision to end the relationship, um, from a place of peace and from a place of love. and. Because the thing is, is if you get to a place where you decide to end your relationship, you are going to have to live with you for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter who shares your home. You will live with yourself for the rest of your life. So you might as well be a good companion. You might as well, um, like leave a relationship from a place of love than from bitterness, anger, hate, and all those things. You just got to carry that all with you. And that's not going to serve you or your family. So if that's the space you're in, you know, being able to get to that place. But I I was able to do that in total peace and love and tell him like, I'm done. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like I, and I don't want to, I love you. I want you to be happy. I want you to live your life. I want you to go get as many tattoos as you want. Go drink as often as you want. Go do all the things you want to do. Just don't do it with me. Like I'm, I want something different and I totally love you. And we had that very endearing, heartfelt and emotional conversation. And it was, um, and I was serious. It was no, there was no like, (laughs) um, threat. This wasn't a threat. This wasn't a manipulation. Please don't ever. That's like one of the most destructive things you can do for your relationship is make those, um, say those kinds of things about divorce out of manipulation or anger or whatever. Um, but I was able to do that. And then it was a few days later that he came back to me and he was like, you know, please just give me one more chance. I don't want this to end and whatever. And then we were able to move forward from there. And that is a whole other story, but, um, yeah, so, so we are still married just so I'm very clear. And I have to say if he had never gone through what he has gone through and continues to go through. And I'm not going to tell you there aren't still sticky spaces. There totally are, but mm-hmm. it's how we navigate it. That's different. And if he had never done this, I don't believe we would have been, we'd be in this place that we are in our marriage, you know? Yeah. So, so I have to say, I don't agree with everything that he thinks and all the things, right. But I love and respect him for it all the same, because that was authentic to him. And mm. he allows me to be authentic to me. And then we just get to show up and love each other in the relationship that we have with each other. And that I think is a really beautiful thing. That's a, that's a gift. And so I'm grateful for that. And my, again, my faith has so has grown so much. It's not in that stage three, check the boxes faith. It's, I still question things, but I do it with a back of faith, you know? So and he still questions things and it's okay that he's in the stage of faith that he's in. He's like in a stage four, which is where we question all the things. So that's all good with me. 
it's just, it's very neutral to me now. It's like, oh, this is just the stage he's in. It's not a problem. I get to show up and love him because his job is to exist for me to love him. And my job is to show up in love for myself mm-hmm. and for him. So That's so beautiful. Um, have you heard the podcast with Brene Brown and Father Richard Rohr? No. By chance, you would love it. You Anyways, tell. We'll talk, <laughs> we'll talk more about it. It's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, it's a conversation really about stage four faith. Mm. And what that looks like and kind of leaning into these spaces that we sometimes resist Mm -hmm. or we may get so stuck in a box in black and white thinking that we may not expand. But this conversation is really about how you expand in your faith and what that looks like. Mm. It's beautiful. beautiful I'm going to listen to that. Yeah. So the question I have, it has to do a little bit about what your stage four faith looks like now and how that has shifted and changed Mm -hmm. as well as like, what does it look like for your family now knowing that, um, you know, for your children, for you and your partner, knowing that you both um, are in different spaces yet still hold space for each other and still have a lot of love, Mm -hmm. a lot of love and grace for each other. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So first, I guess my faith, like, I just don't get caught up in the weeds about things like Mm -hmm. let's, and I really have differentiated for myself. And again, for my clients, I love to do this too, is differentiating what's culture, what's tradition, what's policy, Mm -hmm. what's doctrine, Mm -hmm. because we Mm -hmm. get those all enmeshed in our brains. And Mm -hmm. then, and then again, that's where the bitterness and things come from. So I think you first have to delineate and differentiate each of those different things, separate them out and Mm -hmm. see them for what they are. Yes. And and I think that right there is huge. Like I think beautiful. that's huge. Um, And then does that answer that first question? (laughs) Yes, it does. Okay. Um, But I would also say for my family, And for those of you who are, have gone through this or are going through it, you know, you still have all the things like baptisms and ordinations and the things that are still happening for your family. And now what, how, where does that leave you with your spouse and, and how do you navigate that without it being awkward and, you know, and, and still showing up and teaching your kids. And I think that's where that values, um, exercise is really important because when you and your husband or your wife are on the same page with your values, you may go about teaching things differently, but you are still teaching the same values. And what a gift to show your kids that you can have different belief systems, but the same values and show up in love and respect for one another and still teach them all of the values and principles that you want them to have to move them through their life successfully. And so when those ordinations, those baptisms, those different things come up, there's, there's greater respect and appreciation for each other. Like I remember the first one that happened for us was my son's baptism. And I just remember our conversation was like, honey, what do you want to do here? Like, how do you feel about this? And, and he has some feelings about having kids baptized when they're eight. He doesn't think he thinks they should be baptized later and whatever. And so, you know, I gave that a lot of thought and I went, you know, what could be right about that? And what do I agree with and disagree with? And I was like, you know what, I'm going to approach this differently. So I went to my son and we talked a lot about, you know, do you want to be baptized and why? And when he said, well, cause everyone else is doing, it, I was like, son, I'm sorry. That's not a good reason. Let's give this some thought mm-hmm. and some prayer. And I want you to come up with what your reason is. Here are the things you've been taught. What are you, ch- what do you choose to believe? And what are you still unsure of? It's all a safe space for you to ask your questions, but this is a dis- decision that you need to make and not make it from a place just cause everyone else is doing it. And so again, I'm just going to say, would I have approached it in that way? without this transition in my family, not quite so intentional. I wouldn't have, I would have gone in that. Okay. Yep. This is what we do. We're eight. We check the box. We get baptized. Right. I wouldn't have been quite so intentional about it. And I was very intentional about it. So, and again, 
I think you can see it as a crisis or you can see this as a gift for growth. And I think that's a much more productive, loving place to come from than from crisis. I love that. So I have a question in your home. Do you find yourself um, both sharing both perspectives? And um, so instead of teaching doctrine, do you end up teaching values and faith? Or is it just a mix of what you both believe in? Um, I would say it's a mix because I absolutely teach them doctrine. Like we do, Mm -hmm. we do our come follow me. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, I still am, I still, cause that's me. Right. And I Mm -hmm. think that's important in a marriage is you still have to show up as you. And I'll, I'll tell you what I remember when we were in the thick of all the things and it was just after the betrayal conversation, but before the, Hey, I'm done conversation. And I just, I had felt like in everything that I was teaching or wanted to teach my kids, I felt like I was kind of walking on eggshells, like, okay, well, is dad home? Can I teach this right now? I don't know if I can say this because dad's here. Okay. Maybe I'll reserve that for another time. And I just remember this moment I was standing in my bathroom, I was getting ready for church and just like this thought that entered my brain with so much power. And it just was, you're walking on eggshells with your beliefs. It's time for you to rise up and lead your family Stop mm-hmm. walking on eggshells. And I just, that was like, yeah, cause I'm not happy walking on eggshells and I'm trying to be so accepting of him and I'm walking on eggshells and I'm not being me. And so Anyway, it was a moment where I was like, okay, okay, hey, let's have another conversation about this, you know? And, yeah. And it's like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to teach the kids the way I would teach the kids. And you can show up and teach them the way you would teach them. We're still teaching the same values and let's just respect each other for it. And he was like, yeah, I'm totally in for that. So I do, we do both. And he, asks questions and stuff in front of the kids. Sometimes and I'm like, Ooh, you know, brings up a little, like, yeah. I want him to ask that question or say that thing, yeah. you know, but I just have to really take a deep breath and be like, this is so good for them because guess what? Every single one of us in this life chooses. That's what the plan of salvation is all about. It's all about agency. God protects that. He doesn't force things upon us because he values it. It's what we fought for in the preexistence. It's it's the plan. So the beauty of it is my kids get to hear different sides of something and make their choice with a very well-informed place. I love that. Yeah. It's a very growing and stretching space for them to be in, to see both perspectives and learn from those perspectives. Well, thank you so much. This has just been such a beautiful conversation and it's just been such an honor to be with you. I love how you shared how love brings us back to each other and how we can really hold space in this really loving and kind space for one another. Yeah. Thank you so much. I just, I appreciate the conversation and I'll tell you what, in all of this, that's one of the first things God taught me was right after the beginning happened. And he said, I'm, my husband said, I'm done with all of this. And I was lots of prayer and pondering and thinking. And I just remember the direct message was love him. Mm. This is your opportunity to show him how I love. And I love that. I think that if we can apply that and learn more about that for ourselves, then it's easier to extend it to the people around us. And I think that love really is the thing that brings us back. It's the thing that heals us all. And God is love. So yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Is there a way for people to get connected with you if they have any questions or if they are interested in coaching? Yeah. So they can go to terricabishop.com. That's my okay. website. Um, or you can find me on Instagram at inspired to the T and it's the number two. So it's inspired to the nice. T. Yeah. Okay. We'll include all of that in the show notes as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank having me, so Sarah. Much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the heart and soul wellness podcast with your host, Sarah Carter. 
Make sure to like and subscribe, and if you have any thoughts about what we talked about today, leave a comment. Also, you can find us at heartandsoulwellness.org and on Facebook and Instagram. Join us again as we continue to help women heal, connect, and aspire to their true and authentic selves.